In this video, we're continuing to look at hardware-based approaches to network traffic monitoring. The big difference is that now we're trying to measure latency. In the last couple approaches we looked at, we were looking at volumes of traffic and who's talking to whom and even differentiating types of traffic. But none of those approaches were able to measure the latency of traffic through the network. The paper we're looking at today in particular looks at latency in the core of the network. Measuring latency is quite challenging and is almost always approached with an active traffic measurement approach, meaning that packets are injected into the measurement with a timestamp, and then when they are received on the other side of the measurement, the difference between the timestamp contained in the packet and the current time when they are received is computed to infer the latency through the network. However, as with all active measurements, this injection of traffic affects the network itself and causes overhead, which may be significant depending on the volume of traffic being injected. While the internet is designed to be best effort, there are many applications that can benefit from low latency paths. Interactive human protocols such as voice over IP or video conferencing can operate acceptably in the tens to low hundreds of milliseconds of latency. However, other applications like high performance computing and automated trading rely on delays that are orders of magnitude lower than this. The authors of this paper come up with a novel approach to implement a latency computation by measuring the existing traffic and adding only a minimal amount of packets to the network. They use what's called a lossy difference aggregator. And this is maintained by both the transmitter and the receiver on a link. So two different routers that have traffic passing through them. So on the sender end of the link, it's recording the traffic timestamps as it passes through and the count of packets. And on the receiving side of the link, it's recording the same information. Then after some period of time, the sending side sends over the results of its data collection to the receiver, which compares the two measurements. The assumption here is that both devices are tightly time synchronized. It also assumes that packets do not get reordered between the two devices. As long as no packets are lost, the computation is simple. The difference in timestamps can be divided by the number of packets, and this will produce the average latency for each packet. However, if there are losses, the device on the sending side will have observed a different number of packets than the device on the receiving side, and so this computation would not work. This is because the devices are not keeping track of each individual packets, just a sum of the packets and the timestamps that pass through. As we've seen in previous talks, it would not be scalable for the devices to try to keep track of every individual packet. So in the case where losses are observed, both the sender and the receiver maintain an array of several timestamp accumulators. So if there's a loss, it'll prevent the computation for one of those accumulators from working, but they'll still have an estimate from the other accumulators. Each end of the connection can make sure that the same packets are mapped to the same accumulators by using a hash function. This hash function is a similar approach to what we saw in the minimalist approach to flow measurement in the flow sampling approach. So here's a simplified example of our lossy difference aggregator. The sender side counts packets and accumulates timestamps. And we see on the receiver side that the timestamps are all higher because those packets arrive later in time. And it can compare the two, and as long as the packet count is the same, it's able to get a difference in timestamps and estimate the delay between the two devices. For any measurement where the packet count is not the same, the computation must be discarded. We know that some loss is expected in real networks. So the measurement approach needs to be designed in a way that's robust to loss. And the author's approach to this problem is to use multiple LDA banks, lossy difference aggregator banks, that are designed to operate under different loss rates. So in this case, on each end of the connection, the packet is first hashed, and depending on where it lands in the hash space, it is mapped into one of the three different aggregators. Each of those aggregators collects packets with a sampling rate tuned to a different loss rate. While the authors of this paper do not perform a hardware implementation, they do look at the level of complexity and what would be required to implement this scheme in hardware. To evaluate the approach, 
the authors simulate a 10 gigabit per second link. And then drop packets at varying rates in order to see how well their difference aggregator performs. In this case, we see that their expected performance was lower than the simulated performance, because in many cases, multiple losses may occur to a single aggregator. So instead of each loss causing an entire calculation to be thrown out, multiple losses may contribute to discarding only one calculation. In general, as we would expect, we see that as the loss rate increases, the number of samples that are successfully measured by the receiver decreases. The authors also tried using different distributions to generate their loss rates because some links are more likely to have burst losses as opposed to randomly distributed losses. On the right side, we can see that while the estimated delay roughly hovers around the true delay, the confidence in that measurement decreases significantly as the loss rate increases and our sample size decreases. The authors then compared using different numbers of banks in their LDA scheme. And the interesting thing here is that across the board, the single bank yields the largest effective sample size. Note that as I've been using the term sample, this is the number of packets that are recorded. And dividing the overall aggregator into more banks always reduces the effective number of samples. With lower numbers of effective samples, we have increased relative error across the board. Now we get to one of the key benefits to this scheme. At the beginning, we said that minimal traffic would be added in order to perform this measurement. And while it could be adjusted, the authors are operating with a one packet per second scheme. So every second, the source sends its accumulators to the receiver. So that would correspond to one hertz in these plots. So in plot A, we see that the effective sample size for the LDA approach is an order of magnitude larger than even sending 10,000 measurement packets per second in an active probing approach. However, the traffic being sent is only one packet per second. As the loss rate increases, this effective sample size drops off faster than with the active probing approach. But even at the worst case with a loss rate of 0.1, which is horrifically bad for a network and generally inoperable, the LDA effective number of samples has only dropped down to between 1000 and 10,000 Hertz. So in all cases, the LDA scheme provides a far higher accuracy than active probing with several orders of magnitude lower traffic impact on the network. So that's all for this paper. A common theme you might notice as we proceed is that there's many different ways to approach these measurements. And we're looking at particular approaches and trying to understand why particular decisions were made and what engineering trade-offs were being optimized. So in many cases, we don't have the option of changing the way that the network hardware works or the operation of the routers. And so active probing might be the only approach available. However, we can see that with the benefit of being able to customize the hardware and maybe introduce this feature as a vendor of IP routers, significant benefits to efficiency could be achieved in measuring latency through the core of the network. That's all for this video. We'll see you on the next one. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.